Welcome everyone to another episode of the Marketing Measurement Matters weekly live show as always with the two Tims. Good morning, gentlemen. But today I'm also very pleased to have Constanze Fichtner with us. Constanze is a marketing science partner at Meta and a lead for brand measurement at Europe. Good morning, Constanze. Morning, everyone. Um, Constanze, you have extensive experience with uh, measuring marketing effectiveness and uh, has uh, worked with many different brands and agencies. Um, so happy to have you on the show and to talk about effects of marketing on long-term um, brand equity. Um, maybe would you be so kind to introduce yourself to our audience? Of course, sure. So first of all, pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Um, so yeah, let me quickly introduce myself. So my name is Constance. I work in marketing science at Meta. I've been with Meta for almost five years now. Before that, I spent um, more than 10 years working with GFK um, in various different roles from analytics, insights, consulting, product development. Now in my role with Meta, um, what I do is I have the pleasure of working with advertisers across Europe, help them measure the effectiveness of their campaigns um, using all different types of, of measurement. But as you said, on top, I have a more strategic role um, on brand measurement, which is more focused on innovating on brand measurement, as well as driving or generating insights on how brand building works in, uh, in digital media. And as part of this role, I spent over the last three years or so, I spent a significant amount of my time on um, how to measure the long-term impact of advertising. Oh, really, really fascinating uh, topic. Um, I think um, so. But before we really dive into the specifics of how to measure um, long-term effects, let's talk a little bit about why advertisers should actually think about the long-term, care about the long-term, and maybe also, um, although this can probably get quite philosophical, um, spend a short amount of time on uh, thinking about like what does it actually mean um, long-term. Definitely. So thanks for the question. I think that's a good one to kick us off. Um, yeah, so first of all, what I would say to keep it short, why advertisers or marketers should care about the long term is because the long term effects of advertising really matter. So uh, unless something we find based on studies across different um, categories, countries, almost globally, consistently, uh, and when I say matter, what it means is that long term effects of advertising drive significant ROI for brands over longer time periods, which you can still attribute back to advertising exposure, but it takes longer, longer for the revenue effects to come in. And as a result, what it means that very often, well, even usually they're not captured in, by measurement because most of the measurement we use um, today, not just in digital media, in general, in advertising are very short-term focused. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that, but if you look at the evidence, then we find that in doing so, um, we are actually neglecting a large part of, of our ROI uh, from advertising, I would say. So this is, first of all, by matters. And then obviously the whole idea of advertising having a long-term impact is not new. Uh, there have been lots of debates and discussions, books have been written about this. I would say what, what was missing for a long time was like um, profound evidence. There was very little evidence on how media drives long-term effects. And it has to do with the fact that um, the long-term impact of advertising is so much more difficult to measure than the short-term impact. Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, econometric modeling allows us to do so. And um, the good news is that in the last two years, there are a number of um, studies that came out um, from various different players in the industry, Kanta, Nielsen, Analytic Partners, and then including Meta. So we have also commissioned a research uh, together with, um, partnered with GFK, Napa, and Nielsen, um, who helped us understand the role of long-term effects um, measured in, in MMM. And the, the finding of these studies is very consistent. Uh, long-term effects matter, and they can be very significant. And in many cases, the ROI uh, that was measured in the long term was higher than the short term ROI. So, which definitely then means, as an as a marketer, you should you should definitely think about long term effects and ideally also include them um, in your planning. Why um, why is it so much harder to measure long term effects compared to short term or mid term effects? 
So yeah, um, yeah maybe, maybe before yeah. diving into that, uh, sorry to 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 you know start at what uh, Tim be, uh, Tim Kleinkamp asked. What, is there like a more or less official definition of what long term is versus short term? Oh, that's my yeah, that's my favorite question. Good one. Uh, no, no, there is no clear definition in, in that respect. Basically, everything that comes on the broadest definition is normally you go for everything that comes on top of the short term. Now, in when you model it in MMM, that gives you an idea of how long long term is. And then what we found it depends on the category for sure. So if you are in in a more in a category with a long purchase cycle, that will be different compared to a like like a fast moving category like CPG or so. Mm -hmm. um, but to give you an idea, um, six to one year, six months to one year is what we found in one of our studies. But again, that may vary. Um, and it also depends on the data that you use in, in your modeling. So there are certainly limitations, but if you are tying the underlying time series you use, is, you have three years of data, obviously then the limit you can look at is three years. It would also probably massively depend on the age of the company or the product, right? And the and the brand of the company and the product, because I think if there is yeah. something like Adidas would suddenly, suddenly change their name, there would probably be a longer problem for them than... Well, if someone, if Atriba would change their name now, sorry for that. <laughs> we did, we did so a couple of times. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you only lost the, well, you only lost the consonants, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I think in a nutshell, is there's no clear definition. And um, if you do it in MMM, it, it can be outcome of the model. The model will tell you how long the long term is you're measuring. And why is it so hard? So why is it so hard? Um, let me maybe start with short-term measurement because one of the reasons most of the measurement I think that we do is short-term uh, is because it's, it's, it's the, the rise of digital became so easy um, to measure the direct response of advertising, which is a fantastic thing for us. It's And also it's essential, of course, to understand these direct response effects. And then on the other hand, uh, long-term effects um, re just require specific methodologies. Um, and it's definitely possible in MMM. And I think the first publications on modeling long-term effects actually came out already 2000, uh, early 2000s, um, uh, 2006 to 2010 or so. Um, so it's also not completely new. These methodologies have been around for a while, but what we now see is that MMM has developed very quickly in the last um, couple of years, has become more popular, more brands actually using MMM. And that obviously comes up with or comes with new opportunities for brands and for modeling or analyzing long-term effects. Because if you already have an MMM in place, it's much easier um, to analyze the long-term on top. As part of our research, we also look, by the way, into other methodologies um, that could be used to measure long-term, um, like lift studies or other approaches. But what we found is actually that at this point, from our point of view, MMM is by far the most powerful um, methodology for long-term measurement. I'm not sure if um, what your experience is, if you have any other experience, um, but certainly more difficult with lift or other methodologies. I think most of us just used Lyft before because it was too difficult to really build MMMs. I mean, it was always very easy to use Lyft models for TV or for in our case, app store features or stuff like this, but really getting it all together, I think the biggest issue is to find the data and to have the data already prepared in a way that you can use it in the future, right? That's uh, especially the bigger the company becomes and the more markets you have, that's not going to be, or it's never an easy way to do that. Certainly, that's the challenge with, um, of course, an uh, MMM and implementing a um, good MMM. And then when we talk about long-term modeling, maybe we'll get to this uh, later in the discussion, but um, uh, you need the, the the importance, it's much more important to have really good data. You have to have um, very granular data to run a long-term model. It's not impossible, um, but you have to have a good setup. Yeah, for sure. What do you mean with um, granular? Um, so if I wasn't, uh, I'm not, but if I was an advertiser, um, how do I need to collect uh, the data? Do I need to get data on the campaign level? Is that what you mean with granular? Do I need to get data on the daily level? Um, why, what granularity matters here? What should I, uh, as an advertiser, should take care of before running the model? Ensure that whoever runs the model has enough um, to work yeah. on. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's, so um, running a long-term MMM is um, using more advanced methodologies, independent of how you model it. And that's why you need more data um, or more granular data, because it's more, more advanced in terms of the methodology used. Maybe let me quickly touch on, on how, how you can actually model this um, in MMM perhaps. Um, very top level. Um, I mean, this would be worth having a, a separate episode, probably, of a, of a podcast. Yeah, happy, happy to do that. Uh, happy to have another episode. <laughs> I can tell. Um, but in general, so there's not just one way of how long-term effects can be modeled in MMM. I think that's important to bear in mind. Um, there are various different methodologies. Overall, I would say there are two different types of two categories um, of, of modeling approaches. One is around integration brand equity in an existing MMM. So the idea is you use brand equity as a time series um, and include it in your model. So brand equity is a construct is normally measured based on surveys. Um, so many advertisers have brand tracking programs in place. Um, again, there's not just one metric and can consist of variables like consideration, brand awareness, preference, uh, whatever it is that is being tracked. What it measures or captures is like, um, the idea is for it to capture consumer predisposition towards a brand that correlates with future sales, right? So, and that's the value. The value then is if you integrate your brand equity metric into your MMM, this gives you an idea of more like the, the long-term impact. Um, and then there are two options. You can either in your model model directly on that brand equity metric, uh, or what I normally recommend advertisers to do is um, uh, include it as almost like as a moderator variable, you model on sales, and you look at the interaction between ad spend brand equity building, and then uh, ROI. So that's one way of doing it. In order to do so, you need to have granular brand equity data, meaning- that's The elephant in the room for most advertisers, I guess, yeah? Yeah, so exactly, so that's- you need to just, For the audience also to understand, if you model a time series model, you would need that brand equity data, if I understand it correctly, more or less the same frequency you have the other variables. So maybe on the weekly level or maybe once you would do the trick or what's your experience with that? Yeah, exactly. Ideally, ideally weekly or at least monthly, not every advertiser has monthly access to monthly brand tracking data. No. Or at also, least a useful brand tracking data. Sorry, can you? Or at least not useful brand tracking data on a monthly level. I would even say, yeah. We tried this a lot and uh, anything below quarterly was either not significant enough or the quality was low. I think it, it's really hard to get this. That's uh, all it's really expensive. It can be, it definitely can be uh, expensive. If you have a high, whatever, high quality brand tracking program, it's an investment for sure. And then also another challenge that comes with this is that very often um, brand tracking data tends to be, the, the, there's not always, big variance in the data, which we need to model though. Uh, so you have to find also a really good metric that is kind of um, where you have that variance you need in order to model. Uh, so a couple of caveats uh, that come with that approach, but I would say for advertisers who have um, a brand tracking program in place and they really trust that data, it can certainly be a good approach. I would even say it's the most, perhaps the most common approach used is brand equity data. Um, it's in terms of methodology is a bit more straightforward compared to other approaches, which we will get to. Um, there are other benefits, or if a company, I don't know, if a company has actually targets on brand equity, I know many big brands, right? Um, even the marketing teams um, are incentivized based on um, brand equity performance, then it might make more sense for, for, for a company to look at brand equity in a model. Um, and then there's this other category of approaches. So the good news for uh, advertisers who don't have granular brand tracking data is there are other ways to model long-term. And uh, an alternative is to model long-term through the sales baseline. So this is what I'm doing now is a very simple description of a <laughs> baseline model, but just to describe the basic idea is what you do is an like um, sales baseline is a concept that um, of, of every standard MMM. So you, if you want to look at incremental revenue impact, you, you, you derive your baseline sales. And baseline sales are sales which are not influenced by any short-term marketing activities. So independent of promotions, price, distribution, and marketing spend. So the 
it's a very interesting metric, by the way, to look at because it gives you an idea of how resistant your um, sales are, um, are or your revenue is. Um, because this is sales, you you don't have to invest into short term um, activities to drive it. And then, in uh, in order to use it for long term modeling. The idea is to make this variable dynamic, to have a dynamic baseline over time. So you have it as a time series, and then you can model or run ad spend against it in a very simple description uh, of this approach. Um, and the idea is for the long-term effects, um, because baseline sets don't include short-term effects, that we find the long-term effects in this, in, this, in this variable. If you would now go into a, or if, if you would work with a established business, I mean, I've, I've been there, I've done this. How would you explain the marketing and the management team that they have to build this baseline? Because I mean, the biggest issue is actually, how do you get to the level that uh, anything is steady without yeah. cutting anything or without stopping growth for like half a year or something like that? Yeah, uh, so um, one of the caveats of this approach is a bit more, it's definitely diff more difficult to explain perhaps to marketing teams or a particular C level, right? Because you, how did you actually model this? What is long term? Yeah. You come up, you have to explain what a sales baseline is. But baseline sales in itself, I think, it is a good metric and, and it's something it that can be valuable, right? Um, and then again, I would say it depends a bit on the category you're operating in. Um, how beneficial it, it, it is um, but overall um, over time I mean the idea is perhaps not to, to have all of your sales as baseline sales but just as a general idea um, to, to, to highlight the importance of have to, to have persistent stable uh, share in, in your sales um, and then on the other hand because the approach is a bit more um, normally the methodology you use is either what we call a state space model or a DLM, or there are various different like subcategories of state space models that could be used in order to make the baseline dynamic and to estimate and to split out the short and the long term. Yeah? So that but then interesting, indep interestingly, independent of whether you run a an equity model or a baseline model, the outcome is very similar. So what you get is a short-term ROI, which is what you would get out of a normal MMM or a standard MMM, and then you get an, a long-term MRI on top. Uh, and these two can be a complementary, so you can add them up and that gives you total MRI. So that's why the beauty of this is that while the methodology that we use might be very complex, the, the interpreting the results can be very straightforward. It's easy to understand. So talking about explaining it to, to a CMO or, or even CFO um, is normally a very uh, straightforward. One, one issue we see a lot with baseline is that it's um, sometimes pretty hard for marketing teams to digest why the baseline is so high. I mean, it sounds pretty you know, intuitive that for big brands, the baseline should be high, um, but it's still hard for marketing managers to see this, that you know, not all of the sales are actually due to the short-term marketing effect. Uh, uh, activities how do you like how do you go about explaining that i mean it sounds so you know yeah. easy but it, it could also be more a cultural problem or like a, just a transition problem um uh, how what's what's your take on the best um, approach i would say for me it's actually one of the reasons why i think looking at long-term effects is beneficial to model on the baseline because then then you explain more of your you get a better understanding of the full return of your advertising invest. Because one of the problems with short-term models is that in, in some cases, you may end up underestimating your total ROI or your ROI. Because particularly for advertisers who do a lot of brand advertising, where, where you have a larger share of long-term effects, you might actually significantly underestimate the true ROI of your ad spend. And then when you model on the, on the baseline that gives you additional ROI to add that up so we have a better understanding I think um, mm -hmm. that's definitely um, a benefit and then it I think it depends on the category we definitely see categories like telco for instance where 80 percent of your uh, sales are, are baseline sales it's not uncommon I think, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and in this case to be honest from my experience you, you might be better off with a brand equity modeling um, for instance, in this particular case. So again, coming to back to my earlier point, it really depends, I think, on the data you have available and the category you're operating in and what your objectives are as a company. 
and in terms of how you how to best model long term. But but, but don't you think? Sorry, Jim. Uh, don't you think that uh, just thinking about this? Isn't the baseline of sales directly correlated to the brand equity? I mean, if I have a good brand level, then my baseline sales will be high and vice versa, right? That, uh... Yes, very good point. Very good point. Exactly. So um, I, that's, I think that's a way to interpret the baseline as well, is, is that like it, it captures brand equity, right? Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's a fair approach. And also, if you have an ideal data situation, then and you have both um, um, data to model the baseline and data, brand equity data, then definitely recommended to do both. So integrate, you can even model brand equity on, your, on the sales baseline. But the other good thing would be if you have one of the both, you wouldn't lose information, right? So if you have a good baseline, then fine, use that. If yeah. you can do brand equity and vice versa, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah. So very often what I see in practice that um, rarely ever have to advertise and have that like ideal pool of data. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you if you have so definitely, um, I know there are also companies out there um, that um, use this approach um, where you combine brand equity and bed the baseline, and then you can actually see how much of your how much brand equity explains. How much of baseline sales can equity expects right? or is explained by brand equity? So um, usually or quite often what we see is that advertisers are because what we model in our sphere tool, for example, is a, is a classical and so contains let's say short to midterm effects, like short term of course, very direct response plus ad stock. Um, and then what we often see, because we also work with um, with bigger brands um, who maybe have a very strong baseline. There's a bit of disappointment, uh, obviously, in the in the in the marketers' um, eyes, then because the baseline. Okay, they understand that this is the result of previous work, but probably it's not the work of them, but their predecessors, and so on and so forth. Um, so, from your experience, very roughly, I know this depends on the category and so on and so forth. What can you typically expect on top? um in terms of uh, extra ROI just just very roughly and also does that differ by on and offline a lot yeah disappointed is a disappointment is a good key right um because yeah, I already mentioned that long-term effects can be or were found to be uh, significant based on research so just to give you an idea and that is now based on our own research but as I mentioned findings are very consistent across different studies uh, in our own research, and that's across categories, when we take the total ROI that combines short and long-term ROI, then what we found is 60% of that total ROI were explained by long-term effects, which basically means that the long-term ROI was higher than the short-term that we oh, found. Cool. It varied by, by category, so it was different for CPG than for tech and doables. In tech and doables, for instance, it was almost 8% of the total ROI were long-term, generated long-term. So that actually means there's a significant ROI that comes on top. And then in many categories, I mean, I'm not sure what your experience is, but I know in, in some categories, the, the short-term ROIs can be very low, particularly um, when for advertisers or marketers who do a lot of uh, brand advertising, you might actually see very short, low short-term ROIs that might even be low one. And that's obviously then a very difficult discussion to have with the CFO if you want to ask for more budget for advertising. You know? so, uh, and then that's certainly a situation where I think um, adding the long-term long -term perspective can add a, a, a huge benefit to advertisers because there's significant ROI on top to, to, to bear in mind um, or to come from advertising. And, and does it differ a lot in your experience between different channels? So, I mean, Tim asked about offline and online. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. I assume that your performance marketing channels might have a uh, consistently low uh, or a lower impact on long-term brand equity increase, I, I would assume, I don't know, just intuitively, uh, compared to, I don't know, TV ads or out of home campaigns. Um, yeah, so uh, as a great question, let me start with the channel. So one of the findings, again, that was very consistent um, across different studies is that um, it's less about the channel itself. Most of the channels were found to drive both short and long-term impact. It's more how, about how you use them. That's one of the findings, which means we found that digital media can drive as much long-term impact almost as, as other media. It really depends on, on the setup 
And in digital media, obviously, digital media allows you to optimize on different objectives. You mentioned performance versus brand, right? You have different objectives to choose and you can vary your setup and depending on how you set up your campaign, it can be focused more on direct response or then a, or brand uh, impact. And one of the findings we got is interestingly that when you look at brand versus performance campaigns or how we would classify them, it's not always clear what is brand, 100% clear what is brand and what, what is performance. But in general, what we find is that both drive short and long-term impact. So you, you always see long-term impact, also see long-term impact to come from performance campaigns. Um, however, if you look at brand campaigns, so that focus on reach rather than in-market audience, right? Um, uh, what we see is that the, the impact there is much more like skewed towards the long-term, which means um, there's a risk to underestimate um, the revenue to coming from brand campaigns if one only looks at the short-term perspective. Because they, in this case, the large part of the error is really long-term. This is not necessarily the case in for performance. Performance mm -hmm. was found to drive both short and long-term impact, but is much more focused on direct response, which makes sense, right? This is what you optimize on, it is a direct purchase or conversion. Yeah. What do, what do you make of this? Um, I, I, Actually, when thinking about it, it seems quite consistent with your finding um, this infamous 60-40 um, rule um, that you should invest 60% in brand marketing and 40% in performance. Um, seems from the outset consistent with your findings on that. So yeah, there is a bit of a, exactly. So the numbers sound familiar, right? 60-40, that's what we got uh, out of the study. But what is important is, um, what are we clear? What we measured is actually what the 60-40 means in our case is how much of the revenue that we identified was short and long-term. It doesn't necessarily mean or imply that the ideal spend is 60-40. So you should spend 60% spend on brand versus performance or so. It doesn't imply that because that's not what we looked at. Um, also in our research, we didn't, um, so the 60-40 is across all marketing activities. It's not just for brand advertising or not just for performance. Um, so this, this is obviously a different, it's just, yeah, for some reason, um, on average, we ended up with 60-40. But again, um, it was very different in, in the category. So tech and roll was, was almost 80 to 20. Um, in CPG, it was the other way around, um, short-term effects dominated. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, it also, de it also depends very much on the uh, strategy or tactics that a company is uh, driving. If they need to increase short-term effectiveness uh, immediately, then they actually probably might not care that much um, for, you know, long-term effects. Ideally, they should, in a substantial manner and uh, sustainable way, um, increase their brand equity, but not, you know, specifically in times right now, it's probably hard to make the argument, yeah, I'm spending now a lot on long-term brands um, because I know in, in a year's time that might be beneficial for us. Maybe the CMO won't be able to hold his job till then. So that's, that's a difficulty, yes, with brand yeah. advertising. But again, um, so based on our research, we saw it's more like in between six months to to one mm -hmm. year. That's necessary. You don't have to wait two years to see yeah. the effects coming. It might take longer, but again, it depends on the category. So. I was referring to a study that was done for tech and roll, so who was laptops and TV. Um, and obviously, if you think of what, what are long-term effects of advertising, a large part of long-term effects are um, just delayed purchases. What, what, how would I describe them, right? So it's a, a consumer who doesn't buy directly. And that can be either because the purchase cycle is longer and it's, or it's a bigger decision to make if you buy a new product, which is expensive, um, but it can also be a new customer you reach with the advertising, meaning um, not a, a user not or a consumer not familiar yet with the brand. So maybe the person needs more time to familiarize or to see the product multiple times until they buy. And that's why we see more longer term effects, I think, from to come from adver brand advertising as opposed to performance. But again, in, in uh, categories with long purchase cycle, like automotive or uh, second row is, is much more, much more relevant. Yeah, I always have the unpleasant job of being the timekeeper here, and we only have one minute left. Uh, but I uh, already feel that we should uh, look for another session uh, of discussing these topics here. I had another question here, but I think I'll spare that for 
for the next session uh, was was very very interesting uh, Conley, uh thanks so much for being on the show um let's yeah let's definitely plan for another session maybe also to, to drive into the technicalities i think we all got the basics of it and um, if you have any links to share we are happy to put them in the comments i think there are some uh, links to the to the studies that you mentioned um i don't know um do you have any further questions tim and tim or constanto you have something to add Many questions, but no Many time. Questions. Yeah, the time runs just too by. There's so much more we can discuss, right? I have this childhood trauma with uh, changing brand names, which is also an interesting thing in this regard. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. Connie, thanks so much for being here. Um, let's definitely repeat this. And um, yeah, have all a great day. I uh, hope the audience liked it. See you all soon. Thank you, Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.